Well, tonight's subject is one that's most critical to the majority of people I meet in life. It's dealing with a spirit of rejection, overcoming, battling a spirit of rejection. And even though a person becomes a Christian, it does not mean that the battle is over. It's just actually begun because the devil will do everything to prove to you that you are an orphan. You have been abandoned by everyone, by God, by everything. And he'll give you every kind of evidence possible to prove that to you. And in the introduction I, that I filmed earlier for 13 and a half minutes, uh, we received some great insights from Kurt Landry Ministries. And he's been an evangelist and he has dealt with all types of uh, deliverance ministry also. And uh, that will be very practical for you to listen to that uh, when this broadcast is over at another time. But in that particular presentation by Kurt Landry, he shares seven or eight different um, possibilities that you might be facing dealing with or recovering from a spirit of rejection, a battling of the mind to accept yourself and to accept others and to be willing to let others accept you. Uh, to understand the spirit of rejection, we have to know, first of all, where does it come from, okay? And we find this in uh, the book of 1 John 4, 3 through 4, which reads, And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And we have to realize that the spirit of rejection comes from the devil. It goes all the way back to the time that Satan himself rejected Almighty God in heaven, was cast forth into the earth, with at least one third of all the demonic forces, the fallen angels, were cast to the earth. People wrongly think that the, the devil is in hell and the demons are in hell all the time. They're actually... Uh, having much sovereignty here on the earth uh, for a season until the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom fully on the earth. And uh, so this is a spiritual warfare situation. It happens in the mind. It happens in our will. It happens in our emotions. It's actually a spiritual stronghold that we have to deal with, not just before we're saved, but even more so after we're saved. Because the devil wants you to believe, he wants me to believe that we are rejected and he will bring, bring every evidence possible into your life to do that. Uh, he will cause people to feel they're rejected by some of their family members, their parents, one parent or the other, brothers or sisters. And as I shared in the introduction earlier, that uh, we feel rejected because we weren't chosen on team, we didn't get the part in the class play. Uh, we did not get the seat we wanted in the classroom. The teacher favored someone else, whatever it might be. But tonight we want to talk about where does it come from and uh, what's the first step in dealing and or battling and overcoming uh, the spirit of rejection. First of all, you need to know that the spirit of rejection comes from the father of lies, Beelzebub, also the father of the flies, you know, the Lord of the flies. And so we need to realize that this is a uh, battle between truth and reality. Uh, and we need to seek godly counsel. We don't need to go to any um, society or any organization or some TV personality. We need to go to God's word to get God's counsel, God's truth, to overcome a spirit of rejection. Um, these lies that Satan plants into our life from early childhood, in fact, uh, it has also been discussed by many spiritual leaders that many of these spiritual problems actually start within the womb, that they, a child, the spirit of a child within a, within a person can somehow sense that the mother does not want the child or that there's some rejection to this child coming into the earth. And, uh, uh, some people don't know why, but they've studied it from uh, spiritual purposes and uh, perspectives, but also even from uh, educational facilities, they've come to realize that the baby, baby knows within the womb whether it's accepted or rejected. When Karen and I were expecting our first child, Catherine Elizabeth, uh, we were so delighted. We were just thrilled to death. 
And uh, once we found out for sure that Karen was uh, uh, carrying our first child, we gave the child immediately to the Lord. And almost daily, we would sing songs to the baby. I would put my head next to her abdomen and we would sing and worship the Lord. We would quote scripture. We read the Bible regularly to the child within the womb. And we do believe that, that God is intervening in the situation to protect the child within the womb. Uh, Karen and I believe very strongly that life begins at conception. And uh, therefore we believe that that child is growing and we want it to, to follow the same path of the prophet Samuel and the same path as the Lord Jesus. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So as a child is within the womb, we need to pray that that child will grow in stature, in size, in uh, physical development, but also in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, the lies that the devil brings into our life create depression, anxiety, doubt, and different types of addiction. But we have to decide whether or not we're going to let those things happen and develop in our life or not. Uh, years ago, I may have shared this before, but I took several groups to Israel. And uh, so we took a group to Israel. And a few months later, I was pastoring a church in uh, Cardiff County. And we had a teaching on the Lord's Supper. And we had the ordinance of um, foot washing, which is observed in many Christian circles. And uh, we did it in Israel. We, now we did it in uh, uh, North Carolina. And that morning after we preached on this, we allowed people to wash people's feet. And so uh, during the service, this lady uh, in her 50s came over to me and said, Pastor Oliver, uh, would you let me wash your feet? I said, yes, but I, you don't need to do it. You know, I know you love me and uh, whatever. And she said, but you don't understand. She said, I have hated you for months. I said, how could you have hated me? I've loved you. I've, I've uh, taken you to lunch. My wife and I just think very dearly of you. She said, it all goes back to the time we went to Israel together. And uh, on New Year's Eve that year, uh, some of us came to the five-star hotel dinner at the hotel and said, after dinner, we're going to the New Year's celebration of folk dancing, Israeli folk dancing. Would you like to go with us? She and one other lady. And I jokingly, which I've done wrong many times in my sense of humor or warped sense of humor said, do you think I wanna be seen with you in public? And she looked at me and, and uh, I laughed and I thought, sure, she knew I was joking. I mean, this is kind of talk that guys say all the time and women sometimes say something like that, but maybe, maybe not as frankly. And so she said that night, I did not go to that uh, folklore dancing thing in Israel. I went up to my room and cried all night long. I said, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just joking. She said, and I have hated you ever since. And, uh, she said, but the Lord convicted me this morning that it was not you that I hated. I saw you as an authority in my life that rejected me as a child because I had mixed heritage in my background as far as my family. And I was always talked about and rejected and left out of the family. And uh, people in the family did not want to be associated with me. They were always wanting to hide me somewhere in the house or, or whatever. And here, this had been in her life for over 50 years. And she felt rejected by almost everyone. And then her pastor, who loved her dearly, but did not know how to curb his warped sense of humor at times, said, do you think I want to be seen in public with you? And she took that as reality. And, uh, and Satan took that and built that up in her mind that I was ashamed of her. And she picked up all those people in life. She was made fun of in school. She was rejected by groups because of her racial blend or whatever. And so um, I, I really grieved that I had caused such pain for, for months until she washed my feet that morning. 
and the conflict was broken by the spirit of the Lord in that mm -hmm. act of submission and obedience. So we, rejection is real and we have to, we have to trust God to give us the, um, the wisdom to know when to say things and when to keep our mouth shut. I've said that regularly several times. And I, like Paul in the Bible, and the chief of sinners at times, of saying too much. And so maybe some of you would say, oh, me, rather than amen to that. But sometimes we say too much, especially to the people we love the dearest, our family and our friends. Well, first of all, we need to realize that God designed us to desire love and acceptance. We were made that way. And if we don't get it from God and from godly ordained institutions and relationships, we're going to seek it somewhere. Uh, I remember when my, my brother's wife died, leaving him with four children. He called me up and said, It's a monkey, yes. You, you want to uh, mute? That's a penguin. You want to mute? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so when he was left with four children, three sons and a daughter, uh, he called me up and he said, I don't know what to do with her. You know, I don't know what to do with the boys, but whatever. And I said, well, start brushing her hair, start telling her how pretty she is, start doing all these things to affirm her as a young lady. Because if you don't, Tommy, my brother Tommy, I said, some guy will and she'll be snatched up and ruined for life. And so he started doing that later. A Christian teacher came and helped him with her. And eventually, six months or a year later, he married that Christian teacher and she came to be the mother of all four children. And they had two children of their own. Uh, people want to be loved and accepted. It's God's design to the fulfillment of this desire, but it has to be in his direction it has to be under his guidelines or the enemy the devil and his demons will find someone or something to make us feel accepted or loved when god breathed life into adam he gave him the desires with the intent that adam would find the father's love and god had such a wonderful relationship with adam and then eve was added and then the then the serpent came into the situation in the garden. And the first thing that Satan started doing when he began to relate first to Eve, who was deceived, the Bible says she was deceived, but Adam willingly agreed to be uh, disobedient to God. Uh, then the first thing that Satan did was say, did God really mean what he said? And that's what's happening in our world today. Did God really mean this about marriage? Did God really mean this? about relationships and honor and honesty and all of these things. Uh, Satan questions the word, the will, and the wisdom of God. And so we have to realize that, that, that Satan is the father of lies, and he will question what God tells us to do. Sin entered the world, and we're still suffering from that generational sin. So we need to realize that the spirit of rejection is a generational sin and we know in exodus 20 it says the sins of the father the, the sins of the father passed to the third and fourth generation and each of us sitting in this this teaching tonight uh have sins that have run through your family whether you believe it or receive it or not there are generational sins that come from families it could be lying it could be cheating it could be immorality it could be all kinds of cursing it could be all kinds of things and uh, if you are asking God to reveal it, he'll show you generational sins that travel through families, through cultures. And uh, we need to, first of all, realize that the sin of rejection is, is a generational sin, and God wants us to overcome that. Now, why do we have these problems in our family lines? Because somewhere, somehow, someone neglected us or someone was selfish, there was physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, there was drug use, repeated negative words and messages, broken marriages and families, the inability to accept parental roles, 
and go on and on and on. These things don't just happen by themselves. They happen from generation to generation until someone says, stop, devil, you have no place here. And the person becomes saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to battle Satan rather than to fall prey to his attacks and temptations. It's through the generational curses that the oppressive spirits look for opportunities to attach to us. We've seen movies or we've heard stories about where something will jump on you, you know, whatever. And uh, it's like that to some degree with evil spirits. They will find some way to attach themselves to us, mostly through some type of generational curse. We are each born with a desire to be loved. However, when we do not experience it the way God designed it, the enemy will attempt to accuse us of these circumstances in our family line. And we had nothing to do with it. But we need to reject any hold it may have, you know, anything, any uh, evil that has come down through the family. We need to reject it. Otherwise, it will look for opportunities to spread. Then he suddenly looks for opportunities for spiritual oppression to take root. The devil has one main purpose, to destroy you and me. He wants to destroy Jesus Christ, the church. Uh, the devil is not worried about all these sinful people committing all these sinful things in the world. He already has them under his power and his control. But he does have a purpose to attack us, the children of God, the family of God, the bride of Christ. Understand that this all takes place in the spiritual realm. It may have physical uh, consequences. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we are not in war with flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood. But with, we're in war with principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness in heavenly places. Ephesians 6.12 once we understand the strategy of the devil, our enemy, then we need to, to combat this spirit of rejection in the spiritual realm. We need to, first of all, understand how to activate the word of God. And uh, Karen, if you will look up James 1, 22 through 25, uh, we'll have that in a second. And... Uh, then we also need to use the word of God to take down the enemy. If someone would read uh, Ephesians 6, 17, who would do that? Pat, would you do that? Ephesians 6, 17. Okay. And, uh, and then we need to be set free from the stronghold of rejection and give victory. John 8, 36. Raymond, would you do that? Okay. Cheryl, if you would mute. Sorry, I guess you heard the baby's video. Okay, Karen, would you tell us how to activate the word of God, James 1, 22 through 25? Unmute. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. Amen. So we must, we must activate the word of God on our behalf to fight the spirit of rejection. And Pat, in Ephesians 6, 17, we're told how to use the word of God to take down the enemy. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that whole chapter deals with the spiritual armor that God has provided for the church, for uh, a Christian army, a spiritual army to combat the evil in this world. 
And then in John 8, 36, we're to set free from the stronghold of rejection and live victoriously. Raymond, John 8, 36. John 8, 36. I think I got distracted. I was hearing a lot of what was going on in the background when you called me on that. Yeah. John 8, 36. So the sun sets you free. You will be free indeed. What does that mean, Raymond? It's when Jesus sets us free, then we're, we don't have the bondage of the enemy. We don't have his, um, um, his rejection or his things coming into our minds to, uh, um, to take us away from the promises that Jesus and the Father have given us. We've all seen pictures or movies or television programs of people wearing uh, shackles. Shackles on their uh, legs, feet, uh, and think of all of the different kinds of ways that a person could be shackled. Around the neck, they used to have a, uh, like a shackle around the neck. They had them on the hands, they had them on the legs, the feet, the knees sometimes. And these are different types of demonic attacks that Satan has against people. And even the church must be set free because we don't just get completely free when we get, we get saved. You know, um, some people have been misled by uh, sweet-minded people who say, come to Jesus and everything will be all right. That's not true. If you've been a mature Christian, you know that you have many more conflicts ahead. You will, it will be all right in the sense that God is with you. He will no longer uh, forsake you. He'll be there with you and he'll help you fight the battles. But we have a life until we are resurrected into heaven or we go directly to heaven if we're here uh, when we die. And therefore, we need to be sure that we're set free indeed. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can be victorious. Say that we can be victorious. Okay. Not just a nice little V or a peace sign, but we can actually be set free. We can be victorious. Victorious in the battle against the spirit of rejection. His blood was shed for you and me, and it still speaks on our behalf. And that's told to us in Hebrews 12, 24, if someone will find that for us. So how do we battle the spirit of rejection? John 10, 10 is familiar to us, tells us that these oppressive spirits from the enemy come to steal, kill, and destroy. Even though many of these lying spirits, like the spirit of rejection, flatter us, say, just, just come my direction, you know, let's go to uh, Vanity, let's go to uh, the Pilgrim's Progress type of story where we go into a Vanity Fair and everything's there. It's like everything's for our pleasure and comfort. It's a deception. It's a flattery. Someone have Hebrews 12, 24? Mm -hmm. I've got it. Thank you. To, G to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Okay, so the blood of Jesus covers our sin. It covers the sins that were put upon Jesus Christ. And we have to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, my sins helped nail him there. And if you're honest, you have to admit that your sins also helped nail Jesus Christ to the cross. One of my favorite pictures is up here in my office. I should have brought it down. But it shows this man wearing a t-shirt and jeans. He's got a hammer in his hand. And his blood is coming out of uh, Jesus. And the guy who nailed the uh, nails into uh, Jesus was actually me or you. We we're those who helped to crucify Jesus by our sins. But praise God, if you look at the rest of the picture, which many people don't see, the blood runs down the cross to the ground and all these beautiful white lilies spring up. Love grew where the blood fell. Jesus had to die. It was a part of God's will that Jesus the Son of God be the eternal sacrifice, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth, not from the time you and I were born, but before the world was created, 
God realized that he would have to give Jesus Christ, his only son, to die for the sins of mankind. Well, how do we battle? We begin by prayerfully asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the root cause of this oppressive spirit. Where did it start? Where did this rejection? Who was the person that wanted us to hide in the other room when company came? Who was the person who said, oh, you'll never be an athlete. You're, you're too runty. You're, you're the run of the litter. Uh, who was the person that told us that we were different in a negative way? It starts some cause early in our life. And there are many Christian ministries built on redeeming people from the, the roots of their sinful rejection. And they need to, people need to be set free. It's not just come to Jesus. It's come to be Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Join in the fight against Satan. Second, we need to repent of the areas and times we have believed the spirit of rejection. It's an orphan spirit over the spirit of sonship. We are the sons and daughters of the living God. And yet the devil will use people and situations in the spirit of rejection and all those demonic forces to convince us that we are not worth anything. I'm talking about Christians. You know people. We know ourselves at times. We feel like, what's the use? I've missed all my opportunities. My, my life is over. Uh, I failed in this or that. And the devil will do everything he can to convince us that we have lost. But the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. So we need to repent of those times when we have yielded to the spirit of rejection. And we need to take each thought of the Holy Spirit captive, we're told. Renounce it. We are sons of God. The Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them, those who received, to them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God. God paid the price. Jesus shed his blood. He took our place on the cross. We have to receive him and believe the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. Renounce any rejections that people give you, and especially those that you give yourself. How do you fight the spirit of rejection? Declare your identity in Christ. There are lists on, on the internet that you can get. I'll be glad to send you a copy. I am in Christ and gives you all the things you are. You know, I'm a child of God. I'm a co-inheritor of the kingdom of God. I am the apple of God's eye. On and on and on. I am, I am. God's name, I am, that's what his name is, I am, I am that I am, I am, I will be what I will be is the name of God, it's what Yahweh means, and we need to take that now as children of the living God, and know who we are in Christ, identify ourselves in Christ, we need to stay in the word of God, remember in consistency lies the victory, say that, consistency lies with victory, okay, uh, we need to fill our mind with one who says that we are his, that we will never be forsaken, will never be rejected. The spirit of sonship, or in the case of the femin feminine uh, gender here, daughters, is battling for us against the spirit of rejection and the orphan spirit. Do you want to remain as an orphan or realize who you are? as a son or a daughter of God. My parents have been dead for years, okay? Your earthly parents have been dead for most of you, I guess. Uh, and yet our heavenly father will never leave us nor forsake us. In fact, he's preparing a mansion, a big room, a house on the back 40 for part of his family. That's me and maybe you here. I love that expression when I was growing up in Alabama. I think Pat's laughing about it. The back 40 was the part of the farm that was used 
uh, to expand the family holdings and for a new family to start of the same household, of the same family. Uh, so we need to thank God for all he has done and what he will do as he promises to set us free. Uh, I was raised at a time when temptation was as severe as today, but not as widespread, maybe. And uh, I remember going to some Christian groups and they say, if you're having a problem on a date, you can't keep your hands off each other. You can't fight the temptation of physical intimacy. Then put a big Bible between you and your date in the front seat of the car. That's when we had a front seat. It was like a bench seat instead of bucket seats. And uh, anyone ever heard that? Put a Bible between you and your date. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, that was actually taught in a lot of Christian circles. Uh, and uh, they said, therefore, during the date, it'll be hard to climb over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to the, your date. And uh, you'll be reminded to keep your behavior as Christian citizenship. citizenship. Uh, the spirit of sonship is where we need to focus as we get rid of all this rejection. And what does it mean to be a child of God? And we are to produce the fruit we talked about for six or eight weeks. We went through all the fruit of the Spirit. And these are the things we need to be developing in our life to overcome. And uh, so, therefore, this is actually going to be just part of this teaching. I'm going to give the next part. I'm going to do it on, online directly. Uh, unless I teach this group again on the same subject, but I have much more I want to share in this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote this poem, and it, it could be misinterpreted, but I'm going to read it to you slowly. I'll send a copy if you would like one. Uh, my wife uh, read through the poem, and she happened to see it on the desk here yesterday, day before yesterday, and she thought, uh, she, she saw the focus on the top, but I want you to focus on the second part of the poem. And this is a picture of the poem. You can see that it has two sections. And I will send you a copy if you want one or even if you don't want one, maybe. The name of this poem is Though Rejected. So listen to each part of it and get a picture. See if you can identify to something like this in your life in your family experience, dealing with the spirit of rejection. Though rejected by my childhood community because of my lack of prejudice, though rejected by my fellow classmates because I was double promoted twice, though rejected by my unbelieving family in my youth because of my faith in Jesus, though rejected by the rich for my poverty, and though rejected by the poor for my blessings from God, though rejected by athletic participations because I was more service oriented, though rejected by other musicians because I was too musically talented and blessed, though rejected by liberals because <laughs> I was politically too conservative, though rejected by conservatives because I was too accepting of others, Though rejected by my friends because of their jealousy and egocentricity. Though rejected by Baptists and evangelicals because I was too charismatic. Though rejected by my spouse because of her matriarchal loyalty to our children. Though rejected by my children because they discovered their hero's humanity. Though rejected by weak, non-productive Christians because I was so dedicated. Though rejected by fellow educators because I was so committed to teaching students. Though rejected by so many who ignored, persecuted, and even hated me for being me. Though rejected by those demanding stop the God talk because I have or do hear the voice of God. Though rejected by scoffers, agnostics, and atheists because of my allegiance to God's word. Though rejected by myself because of my perceived and practical, practiced self-rejection. But I know 
after all that rejection in my life. But I know I am my beloved's and he is mine. I know I am the apple of his eye and his light of the world. I know I am a child of God and an inheritor of eternal life. I know I am a partaker of Yahweh's grace with a heavenly home. I know I am anointed by God. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I know I am forgiven and justified by the amazing grace of Jesus. I know I am crucified with Christ. He lives in me. And I am delivered and healed. And though I am not ashamed of the gospel, and I am more than a conqueror for him who loved me. My broken Oliver accepted by my father forever.